I work at Nagoya Gakuin University, and uh, I'll be talking about building an international learning community using a board game club. So here we go. Oh, by the way, uh, in case you missed it, um, my original plan was to present on a project that I was going to do this year, and I was going to talk about um, like what what happened to the students' progression, but uh, because of coronavirus, that died. Um, so what I'll actually be talking about is more kind of the practical side. And uh, I'll also be talking about um, staff and students' views on um, what was basically the pilot year of it. So here we go. First, uh, a little bit of background as to like why I decided to do this. So um, it was kind of my impression that um, international students tend not to mix very much with native students. Um, that was partly from my experience as a student. Um, so I was uh, what we called an international parent. And basically that was you, you took an international student kind of under your wing and you were kind of like a not a tutor exactly, but kind of like a, someone who was there for them if they needed help uh, in theory. So I was a parent to a, a Japanese student, but um, we had a little bit of trouble communicating uh, because I didn't speak any Japanese at the time. And uh, it, his English, he spoke a little bit of English, uh, but also like there weren't really any kind of um, big opportunities to see each other really. It was like, um, I'd email him now and then saying, how are you? He'd email me back saying, I'm good. And that would be kind of it, you know? Um, there, there wasn't much in the way of like, uh, um, arranged social opportunities, which was partly my fault, right? I probably should have been more proactive. Um, and then as a, as a lecturer, I like, I kind of noticed the same thing again. Um, so at my previous university and my current one, it kind of seems like the international students kind of end up in these like little groups and they just kind of walk around together and um, they never really seem to mix with their Japanese students, which I always thought was kind of a shame, right? Um, so I called it the foreign bubble. Um, so again, maybe it's a language barrier thing. Uh, I thought maybe it was an opportunities barrier. Maybe they like didn't have chances to mix. So um, I happen to have a friend who's also a lecturer and uh, at one of these universities and was also an exchange student at one of the universities. Um, she's British. And this is what she said. She said, if they don't have classes together, don't live together and don't hang out in the same places, it's no wonder they don't interact much. I thought, hmm, yeah, harsh, but fair probably. Yeah, so um, just um, thinking about um, our students, they they have classes that are separate from the Japanese students. They have their own kind of international classes. Um, they live in this kind of international dorm, uh, which is only international students. Um, and they don't really have a lot of like, um, like mixed events going on really. So they, they're kind of almost shoved into separate um, bubbles to begin with. So um, the whole goal of this, this board game project was to provide students with the kind of more uh, frequent, informal um, opportunities. And uh, also I, what I thought was important is that opportunities that um, the students are creating and arranging uh, with each other rather than it being kind of a, a pure top-down thing with like staff saying, do this thing and do this thing, you know? Um, and hoping that through that, they'll, they'd form uh, stronger bonds with each other. Um, and hopefully also improve their second language abilities too, uh, both the Japanese and the international students. So um, here's a little bit of background research for you. So um, Willis Allen uh, looked at study abroad students' uh, goals for when they study abroad. And these two are the two common ones. So uh, improving their second language ability and learning about the culture. So two, I think, perfect goals for exchange students. But uh, according to Garcia Maya, 
who was looking at um, EFL exchange students in learning Spanish, uh, found that they tended not to integrate and that uh, probably because of this, uh, the students retreated into these, these bubbles again over time where um, they ended up just kind of separate from the, the, um, the native students, let's say. Um, but uh, the good news is when they do integrate, um, they, they're happier and they're less likely to be homesick. So integration does happen. It's just um, maybe there are some issues that uh, sometimes get in the way. So Kudo and Simkin made this great little uh, list of four, what they thought were four key things to allow integration to happen well. So they were looking at uh, Japanese exchange students living in Australia. And they thought uh, frequency of contact, similarity of personality and age, second language skills, and the receptivity of other nationals, um, in this case, meaning the Australian students, to actually kind of mixing with them. So um, I thought, okay, uh, let's apply this to, to my current university. Uh, frequency of contact, um, there, there, there is some, like uh, the, the campus is uh, mixed. So they're, they're at least seeing each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there, there are a few kind of events, but not a huge amount. So um, I'm giving that one a, a red cross. Similarity of personality and age. Well, um, it's a little bit difficult to say with personality, but um, they're all roughly 20 years old, right? It will take a couple of years. So I think that's probably okay. Uh, second language skills, all of the exchange students can speak Japanese to some extent. So uh, we're kind of at the orange level there. Uh, receptivity of other nationals. So just based on what I hear my students say, like they, they would say how cool it is to be able to speak with uh, foreign students and uh, like how much they'd like to do it. Um, but I also hear them saying that things like kawaii, you know, it's a bit kind of scary. So. I think so, so yeah, they're reasonably receptive, some more than others, some less. So um, looking at this, I think like the, the key issue probably uh, holding things back is probably the frequency of contact. Um, so that's where the clubs come in. So um, also I should mention, uh, my university had, has a whole new campus that started last year. And it's basically focused on um, languages and international students. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's basically a big hall with three levels. And on the first level, um, there's this uh, basically in a Kiowa. It's like a, a little independent language school that students can go to for free. Um, and there are uh, some, uh, I think American, American staff in there. And also uh, students can book lessons with exchange students. So they can learn uh, English or Chinese or whatever. Uh, behind this area, there's a big uh, language zone where uh, it's no English, no Japanese zone, this area, uh, kind of world, world languages zone. Um, at the back, you can see uh, the office where everything kind of happens. And then there's also this uh, teaching assistant zone. This is kind of at the other side of the hall. And uh, in here, it's usually usually about five uh, Japanese students, um, usually some of the older students. And they um, like provide help to everybody. They act as guides. Um, they also provide free lessons, uh, free English lessons. And they also provide Japanese lessons to the uh, exchange students. And kind of in between here and the eye lines that I showed you, there's also like a big, uh, big hall uh, that's got like lots of tables and sofas, uh, lots of areas that in theory they can mix with each other and get to know each other. So um, thinking about face-to-face uh, -face opportunities that uh, the international students have with the uh, native students, um, we've got these one-off events, things like uh, festivals or uh, like maybe they'll have like cultural events, like we'll have like an Easter event or something like that. 
Um, these are arranged by staff and or teaching assistants. We also have um, recurring events. So there's a movie club that's uh, a staff run that uh, happens like a couple of times a semester, I think. Um, and also the language classes that I mentioned. So the kind of the, I guess the, the issue here for me is that um, these one-off events, like they, they're, um, they're quite formal, right? And uh, it's kind of like a come, come and meet the foreign students kind of thing. And uh, so like, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know if uncomfortable is the right word, but it's, it's not so natural, right? Um, and the, the movie club, I think, has a lot of potential, um, but it doesn't happen often enough. And uh, it's also staff run, right? Um, it'd be nice if students had ownership. Um, and the, the language classes are a great idea, um, but it's, it's still kind of like, a, it's kind of setting the, the foreign students up as kind of the other, right? Yeah, you can learn their language or they can learn your language. Um, so there's kind of like a lack of kind of more relaxed, informal, uh, like recurring activities. So um, these kind of mixed clubs maybe, um, but there, there aren't any of those, right? So I thought, okay, well, let's have a go with a board game club. Um, the reason being, it's, uh, it's fairly cheap and easy to arrange. Um, people are not likely to get injured or anything like that. So it's easy to get by staff. Um, and it's also something that uh, I, I have quite a few board games myself, so I can help them out by giving them games. So uh, this is how we actually went about making the club. Uh, so I think this is the four key things that you need for any club really at a university. So you need permission, funding, uh, members, of course, and uh, you need some kind of schedule. So um, for permission, I went to the International Center office uh, and I, I said, hey guys, uh, I want to start up this club to kind of um, get international students and Japanese students mixing more. And they said, great, um, as long as it's not super expensive, we'll give you some funding for it if you want. Um, and then I went to the uh, that kind of Ikaiwa area and had a chat with them about it. And they thought it seemed like a good idea and they said uh, we could use their room. Um, and also they happened to know uh, a couple of students who were actually already playing board games, a couple of international students. But so they kind of had a really informal club uh, just between the two of them. Um, advertising I'll talk about in a second. Um, and also the schedule actually. Um, so the club ran from May 2019 to January 2020, uh, up until everything went apocalyptic. Um, and uh, the schedule itself was arranged by students, but they were meeting twice a week on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, mostly they arranged things through line, I think. So um, the two guys you can see on the left side, uh, that's Cole and Sam. So these were the two guys that I mentioned that were already kind of playing board games with each other. And uh, I just kind of walked up to them one day and said, hey, how do you fancy founding the first international club that we have in the university and they said yeah sounds good um and they they made this poster for me so then um, i put this up at the end of my classes and uh, i also had a chat with a few a uh, few of the staff members who also did the same thing so it was going up in uh, a few economics classrooms uh, i'm in economics i'm in the economics department but i'm an english teacher so it went up in a few economics classrooms uh, and also went up in a couple of English classrooms. And that's how I met the guy on the right, Solta. And he became the club captain. And uh, that was actually really important because um, I don't know if this is uh, true of every Japanese university, but at our university, in order for a uh, club to be an official club at the university, um, the club captain must be a Japanese student. So if you're thinking about making club, uh, I think that's an important point. Um, the other people you can see in the picture, there are two staff members at the back. 
who uh, had heard about it and decided they wanted to come. So there was uh, even more mixing than I expected. And uh, the guy on the right, that's another uh, American international student. So um, actually it was, it was this guy Salter that did most of the kind of um, uh, like a range of the schedule and that kind of thing. It was mostly down to him. These I would say were the most common games. So uh, from the top left corner, we've got uh, Monopoly, Risk, Carcassonne, various card games and uh, Catan in the bottom left. Uh, some of them, some of these games actually they already had in, the, in this kind of Akaiwa zone. Um, and some of the others like Carcassonne and uh, a few other games uh, we bought with the, the small budget we had from the office. And I also donated a game which uh, has now disappeared. That's life. Um, so this is a couple of pictures of what their club looked like in action. So on the photo on the left, you can see Salto again. There are uh, two female Japanese students. There's uh, an American student. And on the right is a, a Chinese student. Then in the photo on the right, uh, the whole left side is American students. And then on the right, there is a Japanese student and Chinese student. And then at the back, there's a staff member who is not involved who just happened to walk past at the time. <laughs> so um, just based on these photos, I think you can get, get a good idea of um, what the club actually looked like. Um, I was pretty happy with um, the mixing that was going on. Um, there, was, there was always a good combination of um, Japanese and foreign students. Um, when, uh, when I was there, uh, generally, they seem to be speaking uh, either English or Chinese, uh, sorry, not Chinese, English or Japanese. So um, based on a few, um, few surveys and interviews, here's what the students thought. So um, Cole, that was the guy with the beard and the glasses. Uh, he said that he made some new friends, um, for example, Sota and that they hung out outside the club. Um, he said that in the club, they spoke English or Japanese. Um, he said that the language that they spoke, um, sometimes they would decide at the beginning of the board game group. Sometimes uh, they would just kind of let it play out. Um, and he felt that he got a lot better at explaining the rules of how to play in Japanese. Uh, and he also said that he's still maintaining contact with a lot of the friends he made. Uh, Sam. So that was uh, the other foreign student who founded it. He said that the club itself wasn't a major part of his social life. He had a lot of other stuff going on, um, but he did enjoy that it gave him like a relaxed atmosphere to practice his Japanese in. Uh, he found that he learned a lot of uh, vocabulary, mostly related to board game stuff. Uh, I think I've already mentioned that it was relaxed. And uh, yeah, he says also that he still makes Kane's contact with the the friends he made in it. On to Sota. So um, Sota said that uh, he pointed out that actually that the games themselves um, could quite often dictate what language they were using because some of the games were the Japanese version and some were the English version. So kind of depending on that, um, that, would, that would have a big effect on what language they spoke, which is not something I uh, even thought about actually when starting the club. Um, he said that mostly he felt like uh, he used Japanese in the, in the club, uh, but sometimes he used English to explain the rules to the students. Um, he didn't feel like he learned new vocabulary, but he, he said this really interesting thing that you can see at the bottom, communication patterns are dan dan wakatikite. So uh, I thought that was super interesting. He, um, he didn't feel like he'd improved his um, his knowledge so much as he'd improved his ability to um, to use that knowledge in an actual conversation. So he, he kind of Scott, you've got five minutes. Thank you. So um, he's he could be talking about fluency. Um, he could be talking about like the pragmatics of like how to actually engage in conversations with people. 
Uh, so that was pretty exciting. Um, unfortunately, there's no hard evidence of that because I wasn't. Even, uh, I didn't record anything at the time, expecting that I would do that this year. Uh, so a little bit more from Sota. I uh, said that he really enjoyed being able to play with the international students. He uh, was able to learn a lot about other cultures. Um, most, I'm guessing, I think um, it was usually Chinese and American students that joined. So I guess that's what he's talking about. He uh, made a Chinese friend, um, actually not in the, the board game club, but outside the board game club. Um, I think he enjoyed the club so much that he started to go to other events too and uh, made this Chinese friend too, uh, who he also still talks with. Um, interestingly, he said that he no longer has the desire to go on an exchange program because he's, uh, he's happy with the experience he's already had with uh, international students. I don't know if that's good or bad, uh, but I'm glad he's happy either way. So, um, also the, uh, the staff in the Akira, this is what they thought. Um, so I'm using uh, fake names this time. He's not really called Ernest, um, but he said uh, it was a great way for students who were looking for new friends or look to share hobbies to meet and have fun together. Um, he noticed that as more students came, like they started bringing their friends so that he was surprised how quickly the club grew. I think I would say at about 20 members, in total, um, but regular members, it was more like five, hmm. I would say. Um, he found that it, it was beneficial for both the uh, people learning Japanese and the people learning uh, English, because um, they were able to use both. And uh, he felt that they, they became a lot more comfortable speaking too, and uh, he thought that they weren't so scared of making mistakes. Uh, so Boris, um, thought that it was a, a really good opportunity for him to get to know some of the students because um, they were do, doing the club kind of in and around the English lounge. So just that itself was um, causing more mixing to happen, right? Um, he, he thought that the international students used mostly Japanese, uh, especially when Japanese students were lower level. And... Um, he also thought that the international students got better. Um, so good all round. So um, next I'm kind of thinking about how to improve the club. And uh, one key thing I think would be more advertising. So uh, we started a little bit late in the year. We started in May, but the semester obviously starts in April. So we'd missed the whole uh, initial uh, like big club sign up day that they have, um, which could have made a big difference to the numbers. Although at the time I was, I was really happy just to have like the, you know, um, just to have like the group of 20. Um, I wasn't planning to have a really big club at that time, but I think if we want to, to really go for it, um, then we should uh, advertise it more fully. And also um, it would be really good to get the, all the language departments on board with it and, um, you know, ad actively advertising it with their students. And uh, we were also talking about um, not necessarily just the board game club, but um, potentially giving students um, bonus points in some of their uh, classes, for example, their English class, if they um, spend more time at these uh, clubs and events. Also more, more games, I think. You can never have too many games. Uh, most of the games were kind of competitive, so uh, I thought it might be nice to have some um, maybe more kind of collaborative type games as not everyone wants to kill the opponent, you know. Um, and also more clubs. So we've already got this movie club that I think right now is a little bit underutilized. Uh, I think if we can make it a student led club and maybe, you know, every month or even every week, uh, that has a lot of potential. I was thinking maybe a reading club. Um, if anybody has any other ideas for clubs, please share with me. I'd love to hear them. Um, and also, uh, it would be really interesting to have the international students join the pre-existing clubs that the Japanese students are in, like, you know, the sports clubs and the music clubs and all that kind of stuff. Um, it might not be necessary to make a lot of new clubs. It might be more important to 
integrate them into the clubs that already exist. Thank you very much. Uh, that's me. And if you'd like to check out those uh, references, there they are. And also that's where I got the images from. So thank you. Okay, could everybody unmute their mics and just give a good round of applause for Scott? Thank you very much. Um, now, the time is three o'clock. Uh, there is no session following this. So if anyone has any questions, uh, we have time if you'd like to stay and ask a question. Uh, yes, Professor Dwayne, I think that is. Yeah, you can just call me Dwayne. Dwayne. Um, Dwayne. Very interesting stuff, and it's nice to see what you're doing in more detail at your site. I just wondered, um, are you bringing any insights from that um, club into your regular classes? Is there any? Ooh, oh, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I might need to think about that for a moment. Am I bringing insights from the club into classes? Mm. While you're thinking, I was wondering if there's maybe something pedagogically that you're seeing happening in those clubs that you can integrate into your tasks in your regular classes, something like that. Yeah, or I haven't really thought a, about that, huh? That's is there a bridge where question. you're inviting some of the club people to help play games with students or something where they can learn that gaming language, for example, if that's a focus of a class? Yeah, that might be an interesting thing to do. Yeah, I haven't thought about that at all. Yeah. Okay. Mm. yeah. Wondered if there's any overlap going on there. Mm -hmm. um so had things worked out this year in terms of face-to-face -face, um because i got kind of a better relationship with the international students i would have had um i was going to ask them to join my classes sometimes as like teaching assistants mm -hmm. um that's something for the future so i guess that's kind of a thing i got from it mm -hmm. so M miguel you were you ever an international student did you ever have this experience <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I was an international student in Gifu. And um, <clears throat> the way we met um, other Japanese students, we had a Ryugakusei club and we would just hang out during lunchtime and just have a picnic together if the weather was good or have mm. certain events. But it, 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 like what Scott said, it was this sort of, I don't know, like show and tell type thing. Like, oh, meet the foreigners. So uh, right. if that's the main MO, you, you get a lot of pushback. But if it's just do something together, I think that's a great opportunity to start something much more informal and such more easier for people to join. Mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds like you'll get a lot more people coming, at least in the beginning, if they get credit. Or maybe that's yeah. going to be a, <laughs> just to do that. But maybe also the word gets out that it is a chance to connect with people and, and there's been good relationships come from mm -hmm. that. Yeah, um, I was actually, um, I wasn't sure how many people would join to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so it would, for a first year, it was kind of the perfect number because it, it was it was enough that the club was like lively every time, but it wasn't so many that they had, you know, like 40 people joining and not. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> In chaos. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll definitely need more games if we're going to expand in the future. And you, you, are we are we okay, Miguel? Another yeah. Th minutes, there's or? nothing coming up. We're free oh, to just okay. chat until the plenary. So if you if you need to go to another um, no, session, fine. Scott, or in, anybody needs to. Um, no, I was just wondering. No. You said from the beginning that things happened, so this became more of a practical presentation. You're talking about mm -hmm. you know what's going on basically, but mm -hmm. you're hoping to do actual research mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. um, could you just say a little bit about what your plan was what data sources you were thinking to use yeah yeah so um i was hoping to um a so so i i presented what uh three surveys and one interviews worth of results no four surveys and one interviews worth of results um i was hoping to survey um all of the students who actually came to the club but i couldn't get in touch with them because they'd all gone home Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> i just happened to um I, you know i was able to get in touch with the founders and the captain um because we're, we're on um closer terms you know like i've got their email addresses mm -hmm. um so i was hoping to do a lot more in terms of surveys and uh, i was also hoping that i could record one or two of their game sessions right and actually, like see what's going on you know um 
like I mentioned that Salter said how he felt like he kind of got better at interacting with people in English. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see like what's actually happening. Yeah. Mm. So you didn't have an opportunity to video you in, no. so you don't know how they're going to react to that request or? No. Yeah, they might say no. Um, um, are there <laughs> rules at your university in that area that they couldn't be recorded, for example? Uh, so uh, in terms of the ethics at my place, it's, it's um, you, as long as it's out of class, it's generally okay as like you're not forcing them to do things in order to get a grade is the thinking. Um, so as long as it's voluntary completely, then it's okay. Can you imagine how valuable that would be if you could document Sota's gradual progression into being able to be more engaged in what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I, I don't I know. What, just one class to see like when they're yeah. using Japanese and when they use no. Right, yeah, right. I agree. You know, you're just having practical experience using the language outside of class. That's that's invaluable in terms of pragmatics. Um, mm. You wonder, though, like if you are recording a session, if you know what I mean, like if you would like alter the results, knowing that yeah. there will be, yeah. oh, 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 we have to use English now. <laughs> let, let me get my dictionary. I don't know what to say. Like, yeah, yeah. So. You know, it, it is the dilemma, right? It yeah. is the conundrum of being the fly in the wall in this situation, yeah. right? Yeah, as soon as you observe it, it changes, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe, um, maybe one possible way around that would be to um, get them used to being recorded, so like do it for a, you know, several weeks or something. But um, I guess the tricky bit is that unless you isolate a group, there are always going to be new people each time. Um, and then it becomes a bit more research and a little bit less of a club for them. But it just seems um, such great peer models. If you have, mm. for example, some interaction where there's language being used, gaming language that you can mm. take to your regular class and say, hey, because we often make games in our classes, right? Or we use some kind of simple game mm. um, that you're looking at. But if you have a, a model that you can bring in video model and say, hey, look at these native speakers or whatever might you know be yeah. interesting for those students yeah. if, if you can't bring in the the people live and you also like um i think in their mind they thought they were learning like how to talk about board games but i suspect if you actually look at what they're saying they're probably just looking at how to talk generally mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of that stuff like you know even like explaining a board game that can you know that can be transferred to explaining anything and, and how to jump in when someone moves one space too far, right? <laughs> There's going to be a kind of motivation. To yeah. Talk, right? if, if yeah. Um, there, there's a really good board game I, I used to play with my students when I was a Kiowa teacher called The Resistance. Maybe you've heard of it, Scott. There is, is, is that the one where like, it's, it's a card game where you betray people? Yes, 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 yes. And um, it's it, it's kind of interesting because you have to lie to be good at this game right you have to like reason as well like why did you do this i think you did that why would you do that instead of doing this and right i i think that's just not, not even just an english skill but a language skill that students could really focus on because mm. in my experience in my experience a lot of my students are terrible liars so <laughs> They need uh, to play the resistance. Right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good one. Mode and they, you know, trying to impress the teacher, right? Always saying what they think <laughs> yeah. they want you to hear, right? <laughs> right, Wouldn't right. It, because isn't yeah. role play kind of acting anyway? And so if they're they're gaming and they need to put on this role of liar, it's it's kind of great because they're free to lie and practice mm. lying. <laughs> that aspect yeah. of language, I guess. Um, by the way, guys, I'm on the hunt for other club ideas. Just wondering if you have any. Other club.